Welcome. We're ready to start our program on uh, how to train and educate our children that are now youth who are from the ages of 15 or 16 all the way to age 19. This is called the high school years. And before we start, we'll have a word of prayer. Should we bow our heads? Dear Father in heaven, thank you so much that you have a divine plan for the education of our youth. We pray that you will meet with us now, that your presence will be felt here, and you will lead us in how we should understand the education for our youth. I thank you for giving us wisdom, for giving us insight on, in how to apply these principles for this age. We thank you in Jesus' name, amen. All right. In the PDF uh, or DVD that you will be uh, receiving if you uh, purchase it at the registration is uh, <clears throat> the information, uh, many of it is the actual books in PDF form so that you can print off for your children. The books for birth to nine years old uh, are there and you can print them. The books for the elementary ages, second grade to eighth grade, the books are there in PDF form and you can print those as well. The material though that you will need for high school is just suggested here and you would have to purchase those books. Uh, the study guides are, as far as I know, uh, not available from sunlight. There are uh, study guides that go along with the books that are suggested. So until that time that those study guides are available, what you would do is go through the books and you would write out your own questions with answers. You make your own study guides. By high school age, you should be able to do this. And that will help you. Having a question and finding the answer from the Bible, especially, is very helpful in testing yourself. So we're going to go through, right now, what is called the roadmap and route. It's wonderful to have a roadmap when you are not aware of how to get to your destination. And so, in the PDF files for the Sunlight Education Ministry material, you will find Roadmap and Route for the younger ages. And this one specifically is for ages 15 to 19. And here we have on the screen, it states design your own program because Remember, we're not trying to mass educate. In other words, educate everyone the exact same way. God has a plan for your children, uh, for your youth, and a specific plan. He has a specific mission for each one of your children. And parents, be praying about what is the mission that God has for each of my individual children because they're not the same missions. And so your job as parents is to direct and guide in their education. So we're going to go through this now, designing your own program for the high school years. High school students should be qualified to do more research and prepare their own textbooks. We have the scripture coming to us from 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. And it says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be what? Perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. The education that we receive from God is to lead us to perfection. 
And what is perfect for one child may not be perfect for the other child because each of us have been given a different number of talents. I'm thankful for those who have 30 talents. But with 30 talents, you are also responsible to use those talents to the glory of God. And one child might only have one talent. And so perfection for each of the children is that they strive for that perfection that they are capable of attaining. We'll go to the next page and let's see what Paul's advice and instruction to Timothy was. This is 2 Timothy chapter 4, 1 through 5. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables but watch thou in all things endure afflictions do the work of evangelists and evangelists make full proof of thy ministry this is Paul's advice to Timothy who was sent to help Paul. And we learn that in his work, Timothy constantly sought Paul's advice and instruction. He did not move from impulse, but exercised consideration and calm thought. Inquiring at every step, is this the way of the Lord? The Holy Spirit found in him One who could be molded and fashioned as a what? A temple for the indwelling of the divine presence. Those who labor for souls must attain to a deeper, fuller, clearer knowledge of God than can be gained by ordinary effort. They must throw all their energies into the work of the master. They are engaged in a high and holy calling, and if they gain souls for their hire, they must lay firm hold upon God, daily receiving grace and power from the source of all blessing. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that de denying ungodliness and worldly lust we shall live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. Titus 2, 11 through 14, and Acts of the Apostles, page 205. Godliness, true education, will develop within us and our children godliness. And we're told that that's what God will have in the last days. He will have a people that returns to not just godliness, which means God-likeness, or reflecting the character of God, but that we will be a people of primitive godliness. Primitive godliness. Primitive means to go back to our origin, to go back to the beginning and when we go back to our beginning, Adam and Eve in the garden, that's where they were to perfect their characters for um, God. And today, that's our 
duty as well to perfect characters, uh, to be a reflection of the character of God. All right, now we're going to go to the first year of high school, grade nine. And so a child or youth might be anywhere from 15 um, to 16 years old, maybe even older. Because if we have not been through true education, then it doesn't hurt us whatsoever to go back even to those family Bible lessons that we give to a smaller child. I have been teaching a family Sabbath school now for the last four years. I don't have any young children. But because I, one of the things uh, that I benefit from, I did not get this kind of training when I was young. And so to be able to go through the Bible stories, spend a whole week learning those Bible stories, once again learning deeper lessons, and then sharing with uh, others, other families, and having them learn to do the same thing. It is so beneficial. So we're used to um, grades, being in certain grades, but when in, you're in true education, if you don't know something, it's okay for you to go back to kindergarten, first grade. We're actually told that the children of Israel, when they came out of Egypt, Moses and Aaron, they're bringing the children of Israel, over two million people came out of Egypt there. And that setting, that God set them up around the sanctuary, first they received the Ten Commandments and then the pattern to build the sanctuary, and that they would volunteer to um, help with the building of that sanctuary, God set them up in what is called kindergarten. Coming out of Egypt is like going back and having to relearn, to be re-educated. And if we are full of pride and not willing to humble ourselves and say, I don't know, I don't know, I don't understand, humble ourselves, say that and learn of Jesus. Unless we become, as Jesus sat before his disciples, a little child, and showed them, unless you become like this little child, in how a child learns, a child is curious, a child desires to learn. And so many times we, uh, we kind of squelch or stop the creativity and that desire by the false system of education. And uh, so as we're learning about the younger children to develop their creativity early on in their life, um, then when a child is a youth, then they will be humble, more humble. So if at this age you, 15, 16, and so forth, have been in a different system of education, ask the Lord to help you to humble yourself so that you can learn from God in the higher school. We call this age group high school age. And I would say that even the smallest child is in the higher school if they're learning God's true way. Because how can we, how can we put a grade level on, on learning that the flower, which represents Christ, that flower uh, tells us of his love, is there, do you have to be in a certain grade to learn that? You do. You have to be in the higher school where you are willing to allow God to teach you spiritual things. When I went to Uchi Pines, I began to work with a, a nine-year-old and a 14-year-old. They were brother and sister. And they had been educated in another system of education. And when I began to teach them using this material, which addresses the spiritual, the physical, and the mental, uh, they, they didn't want it. They said, too spiritual, it's too much Bible. Can you imagine? 
Yes, but it's how we have trained our children. And now that was four years ago. And the 14 year old is now 18. And he came to me and he said, what is true education? Because when they were not there, they did not stay there at Uchi Pines when I got there. Uh, and I tried, I made my attempts to teach them God's way and they didn't want it and their parents didn't accept it either. And now four years later, he's ready to be in college and choose which direction to go with his life. And he's asking me to briefly simplify to him what true education is. It's not something that you can simply answer. But I pointed him and he and his father, I learned, uh, began to read the book Education together to be able to make a decision as to where to go from high school now. And his father is a doctor, a physician, and has worked at Uchi Pines for many years, left and then come back, and I believe he's ready to go again. True education helps to settle us into the truth, to understand the plan, the divine plan that God has for our life. And so we are not just going uh, as a goal to head for something that I want to do. Instead, it's what does God want me to do? What is God's mission for me? And in that way, and as we learn more about the principles of true education, then we will be able to, with God, step by step, go forward, and He will lead us into our mission. My daughter, when she was about uh, 11, 12, she was uh, reading and writing better. And um, we were learning these health principles. I didn't know how to cook healthfully. Uh, God helped me when my daughter was younger. And so by the time she was 11 or 12, I decided, you know, it's going to be a good idea if we write down our recipes. Yes, there are many recipe books available. But when you personalize recipes for recipes that are healthy and that you like, uh, also sometimes you have to alter recipes. Maybe there are food sensitivities. And I had a number of food sensitivities. And so we had uh, recipes that were special to our family. And so one of the school projects, it's not in the sunlight material, um, but God impresses us because we're praying, what is the mission for my child? So I had my daughter make a recipe book. And so she typed up the favorite recipes that God had taught us through a number of years. And then she typed up information about each of the laws of health. And she took pictures and she had illustrations and so forth. She designed uh, her cover and then we went down and we we printed those books we made 10 books 10 recipe books and we would we decided that we would have these 10 books first two, 10 books sent to family members and so in that we printed the books she punched them she had them punched um, we put comb binding on them and then we sent them out to the relatives. Well, they were accepted favorably, and so we decided we'd make 10 more. And this is a math problem. Uh, you start out with one, and then we duplicated that, and we had 10, and then we made 10 more. And those who we, who, who we were worshiping with they learned what she was doing and they wanted their copy. And so she asked for a donation. She wasn't selling them, she asked for a donation and those that could give her a donation, they did. And then she, she started editing. She said, oh, that recipe isn't perfect. She wanted perfection. And so she would edit and maybe uh, she learned some more things about those laws of health, so she added those things. 
and she wanted to have a personal testimony so she wrote out her personal testimony and put it in the recipe book well this time we decided to make 50 copies we made 50 copies and those went very quickly and um, so this was the beginning of how God was leading her in the area of the publishing work. Is that an important work today? Publishing, yes. Where would we be without the printed page? And now we have technology that's good, but we still are helped so much by having the printed page. So little did I know that we would be led eventually to a ministry where we uh, worked in a print shop and that was the main job for both my daughter and myself. God prepared us for that work. So that's why you as parents and family members are to be praying, God, what is my mission? Jesus, we're told, at 12 years old, when he stayed back and was talking with the rabbis, his parents didn't miss him until, what, the second or third day? And then they, where is Where's Jesus? And they had to go back sorrowfully to go find him. And what did Jesus say at 12 years of age to his parents? I must be about my father's business. So even before the parents of Jesus, they were told what Jesus' mission was, but Jesus was being shown even more deeply than his parents what his Heavenly Father's mission was for him. And yet he returned with his parents in subjection to them and was with them until he was 30 years old. So children, youth, you can be praying. You should be praying. Learn how to pray, how to commune with God. And God will be directing you as to where you should go. Even uh, though you may have this material, still God is wanting to lead you to the mission that he has for you. So getting back to uh, the ninth grade material that's suggested or recommended for a freshman, the Bible, the main Bible class for the freshman year is the cross and the shadow. How many of you have seen the cross and the shadow before? A few, all right. The cross and the shadow was written by one of our pioneers, Stephen Haskell. He was the main Bible trainer for our people. And he has written a book on the sanctuary, which is the cross and the shadow. The sanctuary is the foundation of what we believe. And so as a freshman, uh, if, if you were a freshman that had gone through the sunlight material, uh, from birth to nine years old, you would have been introduced to it. In the elementary ages, nine, year, uh, nine years of age, up until high school, you would also have some um, highlights on the sanctuary because that was being taught at that time. And now in high school, you have an opportunity to read for yourself a particular uh, book by Stephen Haskell, The Cross and the Shadow. And like I said before, there, uh, there were study guides, and I believe that's what is being shown here, but I don't think those are available yet in PDF form. So you would read, read a chapter, and then start writing some questions. Or as you're reading, write a question. And uh, the answer can be found right there in the book. Uh, or you can also do a Bible study so that the answers would be found right from the Bible. So um, here we have the cross and the shadow, which would be your main Bible theme for the ninth grade. And the um, suggested tools for uh, learning is uh, the Bible study booklet. If you have gone through the sunlight material in the ninth, at nine years old, you would have been introduced to this tool, the Bible study booklet. 
It basically teaches you how to study the Bible and what tools that you would need. So that is a book, it's stated here, Bible Study, How To from Sunlight. It recommends also the King James Version of the Bible and the King James Version uh, of the Strong's Concordance. So you, uh, if you hadn't learned what or how to use a concordance, you would learn now in the ninth grade. All right, the health topic is uh, taken from the book councils, let's see, no, um, let's see, the Healthy Lifestyle book is recommended. Uh, that is not in PDF form yet as well. I did bring one to our last seminar and it was left, but it can be scanned in and, um, what do you call that, Dropbox to you or uh, in some way we could get it to you so that you could use that. Um, otherwise, it is recommending here as well. Uh, okay, it, it's not recommending that yet, maybe uh, later. Um, it's, if you do not have the healthy lifestyle and uh, you don't get it yet, you could start with the book Councils on Diet and Food and go through that book uh, in your freshman year. And like I said, a study guide uh, could be used along with it. It's very important for us to know what does God say about these topics. <clears throat> Mathematics. This is recommending that you choose a textbook about applied mathematics. Applied mathematics is uh, adding to what you already know about mathematics and learning more specifically from those who use it in practical ways. So you start with your own family. In your family, is there someone that knows how to sew? My daughter learned how to sew in her younger years and uh, God uh, was so gracious to have someone give her a sewing machine. And so she learned to make her own clothes. She started at like nine years old, just making, you know, the straight lines and maybe sewing together um, squares. And so by the time she was 14, 15, she could make her own clothes. And a lot of the clothes she's wearing now, especially the dresses, um, she has made. So in that way, you can learn in a practical way how to measure, how to add, how to be thrifty, um, how to multiply, how to use applied mathematics. In the kitchen, you also learn mathematics and its application. Uh, building, building is very important to learn to do. Um, so mechanics, uh, these are applied mathematics. How is math used? in um, changing the oil. Uh, there's addition, there's subtraction, multiplication, division, uh, fractions, all kinds of ways to use mathematics. So that's what it's recommending here for these years. The more you learn while you're at home, the better. We have students coming from all ages to UT Pines to learn to be medical missionaries. Well, a lot of them don't know how to um, work. They don't know how to uh, take care of a home. They don't know how to cook. They don't know how to sew and all those things. Well, at Uchi Pines, they just give them a little bit of information. I teach four classes on sewing. I've been sewing for over 40 years. I know that there's very little that you can learn in four classes but it gives them a taste. And so many regret not learning from their mothers and their grandmothers how to sew. Their mothers and grandmothers wanted to teach them, but oh no, they didn't want it. And now when they need it so much, uh, it's, they don't have time and it's difficult, more difficult. So I encourage you when you're young to learn all you can. You have free time much, you have much free time um, 
where you can sow. Now, for me, because God has placed in my heart a love for sowing, I will get up. See, I like to go to bed early. Sometimes you may not see me here in the evening because the last 30 years especially, I've trained myself go to bed early and then I'm up by 3 o'clock in the morning, up and awake and uh, ready to go. And I can accomplish much in a few hours when things are quiet, no, one, no interruptions, and I could make a dress easy uh, by the time that everyone else is up in the morning. Or, you know, for the most part, I love to study early, but there are times when I need uh, an, something. It might be, um, well, some garment that I need to get done, and so I will begin to sew. So if you realize how important having practical skills, uh, if you can understand that now while you're young, and then you just keep doing it. Practice makes perfect, so you practice it. God would lead me to make a dress, and then, oh, okay, I wanna make another one, and I make three or four dresses, because every time you make something, it gets better, doesn't it? Practice makes perfect. So um, what I'm trying to bring out here is that God wants you to understand the academics so that you can be tested on it, but most importantly, he wants you to know how to practically apply it. So mathematics, that's what it's recommending, applied mathematics, or consumer mathematics, or there is a DVD available uh, called Financial Principles. Um, we'd have to talk about that, um, where you could get that uh, online, Financial Principles. All right. Um, and I think what that is referring to, how many of you have read the book by Ellen White, Stewardship? Stewardship, all right. That's what it's referring to. Uh, mathematics should first be learned from the Bible. Bible principles of business uh, are vitally important because when we're taught in the world and we get a degree from the world in this area of mathematics, they do not teach you godly principles. There might be some good, and that's why the fault system of education is called eating from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Because there's good and there's bad. And so you really, uh, in order, like Daniel and his three friends, to they are captive in Babylon. They're put through the educational system of Babylon. The only way they came through unscathed is Daniel chapter 1. They purposed in their heart that they would not defile themselves with the king's meat. So first of all, they had the health message. The health message helped them to get through that false system of education, plus their early training that they made God first in everything, everything that they did. So there's nothing wrong with learning uh, academics without God but it's best when I say there's nothing wrong with it. Um, we need to understand the facts and the laws. Uh, physicians who have not had any spiritual training, it's wonderful that they can do surgeries and so forth and they know the human body. The, the problem is, I know when I go to the dentist and he just goes right to work in my mouth without praying with me, um, that disturbs me. When you go to someone who does not a no God and they think that they can do it um, and not that God doesn't um, guide their hands because he does but what God is calling us to uh, is the mission and the mission is to live to bless others and to bring the gospel to others the gospel is that we are sinners we have sinned and we need a savior we need a new heart and so when that is a part of your education, especially these years of the youth and um, earlier, then God is going to help you through whatever you have in store. I'm sure that Daniel and his three friends had no idea when they were being trained in the home where eventually they would end, end up. All right, so mathematics, very important subject. Um, the next subject is music, um, and this leads me to uh, recommend to you, if you're 
dealing with young people at this age, I would recommend to you to read along, parents read along with your youth the 10 principles of true education. That goes right along with the book Education, but it will teach your youth what true education is and how to teach like Jesus taught, as well as how to learn um, God's way. And so in that book, The 10 Principles of True Education, there is a study on music principles. I was so glad to have, be here yesterday for that special music on the guitar by Victor and then I spoke with him afterwards and he teaches music, music principles and he shared with me how God has led him in the area of music and how his views of music and the standard of music has changed since he's become a Christian and converted and um, so he understands the principles of music and the highest standard for music principles is the classical music. Not all classical music is good, but for the most part it adheres to music principles. We have things like country music, jazz, folk music, things like that, that do not adhere to laws and principles. It's anything goes. You can do anything you want without knowing the laws and following them. Well, when music is written that way, it leads your heart away from perfection, from truth and holiness. So in the area of music, um, if we can help our young people when they're very young understand much about what is good music, what is true sacred music, holy music, then at the youth age it won't be so difficult. But right now we're told that right before our probation closes, before we're sealed, and there's no more opportunity to become Christians, that the one thing that's going to come in as a snare especially to the very elect is music music and so I believe that's an area where so many of us are ignorant I know that I was and when I went to sunlight to work there I was told you really need to teach your daughter she was about 16 17 uh, you really need to teach your daughter music principles. Well, I didn't know. I hadn't ever been taught music principles, and I just picked up from going to church and camp meetings, you know, the music that was played, and I just thought that was okay. But as I was learning now, the next seven and a half years especially, that target was I personally, individually, needed to understand better music principles. And so for me, I had to go on a music fast, I had to just not listen to uh, music, what I thought was okay, especially like reformers listen to it, uh, the very elect, uh, who are wanting to be the very elect listen to it, and you're telling me now there is problems with some of it? So I really had to do some searching. Sunlight has some information for you to study but from there you have to go on and you have to keep studying. Uh, the one lecturer that came to Sunlight to teach music principles, she had her PhD in music education. First she had her, I think it's a BS degree in it, and she said that so many people would come to her and they would say, um, could you tell me, you know, if my music that I listen to is good or bad? And here she had a four-year degree, and she had difficulty with that question. And so she went on and got some advanced training, got her doctorate in music, and uh, she was putting on this music seminar uh, there at Sunlight. Well, we learned some things from her. She had a lot of information, historical information, about the origin of some of these uh, types of music that we have today. And it was very enlightening, but I found that uh, another um, person who lectured on music principles, I learned some more things from that person. And we had another uh, lecture 
uh, teach us some things. So what I was seeing, it's similar to the reason that God has many Bible writers of the Bible. Many different ones who have written little here, little there on certain subjects. And that's to, I see, to help us not to just idolize, let's say, one person. Um, but to see that this is the way God also protects the truth. That you have to seek me, God says, with your whole heart. And so it's like putting together the pieces of a puzzle and you are gathering principles, uh, true principles that come from God's word so that you then understand better. Uh, and you keep perfecting that. I don't believe that there's anyone that could say that they know it all in any of the areas of academia. academia. Um, so the other thing is it leads me to think about in the end, remember we're told that people will come to us and want to know the truth, but we can't give it to them because there isn't time anymore. It's time right now to be learning all we can about the truth right now. But there's coming a time when there's going to be a famine in the land. Not a famine of bread and water. Yes, that there is going to be some of that. But we're told a famine of the word of God. And so what I see is that the enemy, he's taken the word of God gradually out of our education. So we may know a lot of facts. We may have a high profession, but we may not be uh, familiar with what God wants us to know about him and his principles. And there's coming a time when it'll be too late. I, we won't be able to tell people all that God has taught us all these years. So I just encourage you to study as though your life depended on it. It does. Don't, there's no excuses today. Remember, that's part of responsibility, not to use excuses. Because the materials are available. You don't have to have money. <laughs> um, God says, come to me, buy of me. You don't have to have gold and silver. So God is providing truth. If you have a Bible, use it. Um, this curriculum from Sunlight, it's free now. It teaches you how to use the Bible, how to teach from the Bible. Your, young, your little children can learn how to use the Bible and hide that in their heart. Because remember, there is coming a time, a famine in the land for the Word of God. All right, so music principles can be utilized uh, from sunlight uh, to understand better what Satan is going to do with music to um, ensnare you, to actually hypnotize you, to get you off track. And all we have to have is a jot or a tittle, and we start veering off the wrong path. All right, the next uh, part for our youth is nature. You continue with the list of lessons under nature, creation day three, four, and five, and in the catalog you can see page 61 through 63. Um, basically in nature, uh, with the earlier programs, you will have learned the pattern of how to study. So there's you can pick anything in nature, study it, and your Bible lesson here is the sanctuary. And it's very interesting, uh, your nature lessons could come right from the sanctuary. You know, God took his people out into the wilderness, and there weren't a lot of plants, were there? So they didn't grow gardens out in the, the desert. But in the sanctuary, God had uh, a reminder of plants right there in the sanctuary. And when you go into the holy place and you look to the left, I believe it is, would, there would be the candlestick. Do you know what the candlestick was carved into? It was gold. 
but it was actually carved into something. The lamp, the lamps had what, seven lamps? And do you know what shape they were? They were almonds. They were almonds in the shape of an almond. And the actual lamp stand had leaves and blossoms. It was represent representative of an almond tree. An almond tree. So you could study for your nature lesson almonds and find out why God used almonds. Where else did God use almonds in the sanctuary? If you go into the most holy place and open up the mercy seat, you'll see the Ten Commandments, you'll see a pot of manna, and you'll see one more thing. What is it? Aaron's rod. Aaron's rod that budded. Budded into almonds. Almond blossoms and almonds. Yes. So almonds are very significant. So along with your sanctuary study, you could bring in the lesson of the almonds and uh, see what God was trying to say there about it. Manna. There's another nature lesson. Um, you could get into even the elements, gold, silver, brass. You could take a periodic table. This would be a math, you know, chemistry. Um, uh, also, you can l learn physics in the sanctuary. But you could look at those different elements and um, see what is God trying to tell us in those elements. So uh, remember, this is design your own program. So for nature, you can choose what it is that you want to be learning. Then there's history, geography, and prophecy. And there's a book called Historical Periods of the World According to the Bible. And um, that book, you actually are going through um, the conflict series once again and seeing Historically, we're told to study the kings. What were the kings like of the different nations? How did they rule? And what were the results of the way they governed? And uh, then in Israel, too, Israel wanted, they were looking out there at uh, the world and said, oh, we want to look like them. We want a king. They didn't need a king, but uh, they wanted one. So you can look at Israel's kings and what was the result of their rule? And what kind of problems did they get into? And the reason that we need to study historical periods is because we are being called to be kings and priests. That's, we're going to reign with God forever. Throughout the universe, we're going to reign. And uh, one of the reasons why we learn from nature and how to govern nature is because that was Adam's job. Uh, he was to have dominion over the earth, not over people, but over the earth. And if you're going to govern something, you must understand uh, how it operates. What are the laws there? And so God is calling us to learn these things now so that we can reign with God uh, forever. It's beautiful. So here's your history, geography, and prophecy. Language and voice. It says, choose a language handbook or a textbook about grammar and composition using your Bible lesson for the example. Your Bible lesson, the sanctuary for the ninth grade, is what you're going to bring everything you're learning from these other academic subjects back to. So you want to keep going over and over your lesson in um, your Bible lesson, Cross in the Shadow. And you're going to see how is health taught there? How is um, language taught there? How is, uh, and you'll be writing. And so uh, to improve your grammar and your writing, uh, you'll want to get rules for grammar, a book. 
uh, on that. All right, and literature. The extra books used with the Bible study will take the place of literature. And so it's uh, referring here to other books on the sanctuary. One is The Path to the Throne of God by Sarah Peck. Uh, these can be uh, purchased online through the different publishing agencies. And I can give you a number of the names of those where you can get some of these books. Another is With Jesus in His Sanctuary by Dr. Leslie Harding. That is a fabulous book to help you to really see deep into the lessons that the sanctuary has. Uh, depending on where you are, what level of learning you're at, even at this age, you might just be uh, able to you know, get through that one book, Cross in the Shadow. That's an excellent one. It'll open your eyes to many things. And then some of these other books might be able to be purchased down the road. And then practical arts. Practical arts, here's some suggestions, some art courses, uh, bookkeeping and accounting, and a lot of this, if you are involved in true education early on, you would have already re been receiving art lessons, and so you would be at a, a higher level, but um, maybe you have a talent in some of these areas. So these are suggestions for practical arts, carpentry, computer, cooking, electrical, gardening, knitting, masonry, mechanics, and other procedures, plumbing, printing, quilting, sewing, and typing. You know, our, um, our jobs, the work that we do, is not to be number one. In other words, we're not to be out there making a lot of money in our job just to do that job. But if we are making a lot of money, it's to advance the gospel work, right? And um, I know I have friends that I went to school with, Adventist schools. They've been working the last 40 years because I've been out of high school for 40 years, over 40 years now. And some of them have just been working, 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 and they don't even, they don't even practice Christianity anymore. So that's not what God is calling us to. He's calling to us to make him the center of our life. And to make him the center of our life, we're going to find out what he wants us to be doing. What is my mission? And my particular mission, he was teaching me when I was a little girl growing up. My mother didn't tell me what um, she wasn't, she was probably praying, but uh, I didn't learn from my mother what my mission should be. But God was showing me. I'd go to school, even though it was public school. And then I'd come home and I'd play school. So my amusement was playing that I was teaching. And if your children are going home and they're pretending that they're preaching, well, that might be a little indication that God is leading them to preach and teach and evangelize. And so you want to help them. Like my daughter, um, when she was about eight or nine and she wasn't reading very well and she gave that little presentation in front of everyone and she just read it real quickly it'll never be forgotten uh, that little presentation was on Ellen White who is Ellen White and how did God come to her and impress her as to what to write and uh, that'd be early in the morning she'd be woken up by an angel one two in the morning and he would say and her hand would be shaking right right and so we are privileged to have her writings to help us to know um, how to live, how to teach, how to be educated, how to eat, uh, all these things, how to dress. God has, has given messages to her from heaven for us, but they won't help us if we don't use them as a part of our education. So I encourage you in that area. So practical arts is very important. Expose your student as to many uh, practical experiences as possible under the guidance or uh, Christian uh, you trust with your student. And then we have um, be sure that um, you're not going so fast in your education that you don't take time to meditate, to um, meditate on the things that God is teaching you. 
and uh, what a blessing that is. It says, and that you study to be quiet and to do your own business and to work with your own hands as we commanded you, 1 Thessalonians 4.11. Uh, work is a blessing. It keeps our hands and minds usefully busy and becomes a safeguard against temptations. And an education that only uses books develops superficial thinking. Practical work develops awareness, independent thought, common sense, what is best, the ability to plan and execute, gives courage, perseverance, tact, and skill. Beautiful. The greatest benefit comes from not merely play or exercise, but rather helpful duties. So uh, teaching your children to be helpful is important. And youth, that's how you can be the happiest, is by serving and being helpful. All right. Tenth grade, we'll just briefly go over uh, the next few years. Uh, tenth grade, uh, the book it says the desire of ages or the cross in its shadow so it's giving you some options here uh, once again uh, you can continue if you don't fit the cross in the shadow in one year you can use it for the next year as well and the same tools the bible study book and it's still recommending the healthy lifestyle for health continue to learn in applied mathematics and consumer mathematics and um, in the area of music, uh, the Baptist Church uh, has a lot of education in the area of music. And so we have on the screen here some DVDs that you can uh, purchase, I believe, online. Uh, they're put out by Frank Garlock or Majesty Music, and they're the Language of Music. It's a series. Also, Pop Goes the Music the nature of music, and um, those are the, the DVDs on music. <clears throat> so if we think that the Seventh-day Adventist church is the only church where the enemy is coming in to distract people as to um, the truth in this area of music, uh, no, it's coming into all the churches. Uh, it's though so dependent on whether or not the leadership in your church is willing to be educated in this area so that uh, we're told educate, 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 educate our flocks as to what the true principles of uh, education in this area of music are. So these are some good resources for learning more about music. And um, nature still uh, staying with historical periods. So all through high school, you could go through, and this is what I did with my daughter, uh, not using this book, Historical Periods, but we went through the conflict series. We would read together one paragraph and talk about it. And so through those four years, that's how we went through it together, which takes you through the Bible. And um, <clears throat> the children, little children's family Bible lessons, that also is taking the child through the conflict series, which is Patriarchs and Prophets, Prophets and Kings. Uh, let's see, what's the next one? Desire of Ages, Acts of, the uh, Acts of the Apostles, and the Great Controversy. So the little child goes through it simply three times by the time they're nine. And then again in high school, you go through it in a deeper way. And if we think that this repetition is like, you know, I've already read that book. No, that's not the case because we could read it. We could read those books throughout eternity and we still won't understand them to the depth that uh, God uh, wants for us. So remember what the fall system of education has done. It has given us a superficial thinking, superficial. And God wants to take us deep. He wants us to go slow if we have to go slow. He wants us to understand what we're reading. He wants us to remember what we're reading so that we can then be his channels to help those around us. So witnessing and taking the three angels messages to the world is more than passing out a track, though that's important. It's more than passing out a book. 
it's more than just coming to meetings and that are put on by great speakers. God wants to use you and you and your little children to be his ministers, to take the gospel to the world. We'll be surprised how many people have been influenced by us when we didn't even know they were watching and observing. So um, this is what our education is uh, trying to bring us to. All right, and then 11th grade, 11th and 12th grade, uh, what's recommended is the books by Stephen Haskell, Daniel the Prophet, and then there's one for um, the senior year, John the Seer of Patmos. So your youth, if you're uh, taking this program, will be learning deeper lessons about Daniel. And in this book, Daniel the Prophet, it goes into in the beginning how Daniel received true education in his early years and this is the reason um, that he he but he had to cooperate just because he received the a true education he had to then he was tested when he was put into Babylon and he chose he purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself and so um, we see and uh, when you study this book Daniel the prophet how Daniel received true education and how it affected his life. All right, and then another book that's recommended is The Great Controversy. Uh, for some reason, there we go, there we go. The Great Controversy is recommended and The Ministry of Healing. So 11th grade brings in the Ministry of Healing book. And this is the way that using the Ministry of Healing that God is wanting to help the community know about the health message and so this is a book as you read it you'll want to share it maybe even canvas it uh, sell it door to door sell it to businesses get that book out to the public all right so the ministry of healing would be your health book the mathematics choose a Christian textbook about algebra geometry trigonometry whatever um, math you uh, will need for your mission and you'll want to know um, and there are many people that have taken these classes now they're uh, in their occupation and you can interview them find out if uh, what they've learned from these books they can apply and um, what to omit uh, what to actually take in so you can actually apply it in that type of occupation uh, it's, it's amazing how many people have gone through um, education, had these kind of courses, never used the material um, that they, they learned, or um, maybe they are in an occupation where they learn some of it, but not all. So you want to find out what is practically being used today. And so um, we are here as a church to help one another and also people that we come in contact with um, may have some of this knowledge that they would be willing to share and help you with. Okay, so mathematics, music, uh, music directing in sunlight. There is a book on how to conduct and my daughter has, she loves conducting. She likes to teach classes on how do you conduct, say in our um, song service, uh, teaching you how to do that because if you have a conductor keeping time then we're all going to be following hopefully learn how to follow and it took me a, a long time to be able to do this you know so not all of us are well coordinated and understand it yes but uh, we need to practice it and um, and learn so you have a book in the sunlight material on conducting uh, so that we can bring our song services up in standards. All right, uh, once again, historical periods for history and language continue to be writing and um, reading. And there is in the 10 principle program principles on what books, what kinds of books to read. Uh, we're told that many people who are reading like fiction, fairy tales, novels, things like that. They're destroying their love 
for the Bible as well as their love for natural things. So we want to beware of that and um, so that we're not, um, we may be praying about it, but we need to know how and what kinds of things to read so that um, our hearts will be right to be led by the Holy Spirit as to what to read. Okay, so 12th grade, same thing, great controversy, continue with that, and um, John on the, in the Seer of Patmos. All right, so this is your high school, um, and there's a little bit more. Here's more about the historical periods, the outline of periods, the Antediluvian period, dispersion period, patriarchal period. These are all the periods that the Bible covers. And um, <clears throat> there's a store, a bookstore in uh, the United States called Barnes and Noble. You might be able to get some books from them online as well. And this Adam's Chart of History uh, normally would sell for like $40, $50 in the States, but Barnes and Noble sells it uh, for about $15. And it goes from Adam and Eve all the way down to our time. And it opens up, so it's just a, a big timeline. And uh, that's a very good um, chart to uh, use for your history classes. Uh, these are some other tools to use in study. And here's some more on the different periods. And we're told, uh, let's read this, enlarging the mind. The mind is the best possession we have, but it must be trained by study, by reflection, by learning in the school of Christ, the best and truest educator the world has ever known. The minds of all who make the word of God their study will enlarge far more than any other study, this is of a nature to increase the powers of comprehension and endow every faculty with new vigor. It brings us into close connection with all heaven, imparting wisdom and knowledge and understanding. The gospel is adapted for spiritual food, to satisfy man's spiritual appetite. In every case, it is just what man needs. Sons and Daughters of God, page 70. All right. Um, this goes into a little more about the cross and the shadow. And grade 11, this is just going over some more details about these different topics that you will be teaching in the high school years. All right. Uh, we're going to get into designing your own school program for 20 to 25. I believe that's this afternoon with Kimberly. And um, I just have a little more for the high school years. All right. It's very important that uh, we do a work study program. In other words, like you get into the high school years, and yes, you're older, you can sit longer, but is school just sitting and pouring over books all day long? Is that what it is? Maybe that's what it is in a typical high school setting, but is that God's way? The education of our youth in writing and speaking upon the life of John the Baptist and the life of Christ, I, Ellen White, have tried to present that which has been presented to me in regard to the education of our youth. We are under obligation to God to study this subject candidly, for it is worthy of close critical examination upon every side. Of John the Baptist, Christ declared, Of them that are born of women, there hath not arisen a greater. Did John the Baptist go to school? Not outside the home. That prophet was led by the Spirit of God into the wilderness, away from the contaminating influences of the city, to obtain an education that would qualify him to receive instruction from God rather than from any of the learned scribes. He
He was not to connect himself with the rabbis. He was not to, con okay, this is a little, um, uh, I didn't, I need to erase that. He was not to connect himself with the rabbis. The less he became acquainted with their teachings, their maxims and traditions, the more easily could the Lord impress his mind and heart and give him the pure mold of truth that was to be given to the people to prepare the way of the Lord. The teachings of the scribes and Pharisees were of a character to turn the people away from the unadulterated truth that was to be presented by the great teacher when he should enter upon his mission. The only hope of the people was to open their hearts and minds to the light sent from heaven by his prophet, the forerunner of Christ. How many years did Ellen White have of school, of formal education? Three years. Third grade, you could say. Three years. She loved school. She loved learning. But God took her out so that he could teach her. These lessons are for us, those who claim to know the truth and understand the great work to be done for this time are to consec consecrate themselves to God, soul, body, and spirit. In heart, in dress, in language, in every respect, they are to separate from the fashions and practices of the world. They are to be a peculiar and holy people. It is not their dress that makes them peculiar, but because they are a peculiar and holy people, they cannot carry what? They cannot carry the marks of likeness to the world. So when you, it's talking about how we dress. Do we look like everyone else? Or are there marks about us that make us separate? I'm always praying about that because I'm not perfect in dress. But I'm always praying, Lord, help me to be better at this. And the, one of the ways that he helps me to know that I'm kind of on track is like a couple of times this has happened. I've been in uh, the parking lot of a grocery store and I'm walking to my car and someone comes up to me. Ma'am, you, you look like a praying woman. Where do you go to church? Because they were looking for a church. And so I tell them where I go to church. And I say, oh, Father in heaven, thank you that someone can identify uh, me as a, a praying person by the way that I dress. Another time I was in a thrift store, that's a store where they sell secondhand clothes. And I was with a group of people and this lady, she was with her husband and she comes up to me and she pulls on my arm and she said, ma'am, could you pray with me? My son is very sick. So I stopped right there and I prayed with her. Her son had cancer and she was able to see that I was a praying person. And so I thank God for those experiences because I only want to represent Christ. I only want to help others in whatever way I can. And so when something like this happens to me, then I, you know, I know that God is watching over me and I'm, I'm going down the right path. And then when I read things like this, that dress is important. Dress is not only important, God represents the way that we dress in the sanctuary. Do you know how he represents how to dress in the sanctuary? In the sanctuary, there's a fence around the court, and it's made out of linen. What color of linen? White linen. And that white linen, we're told in Revelation, represents the righteousness of Christ. White is purity. White is purity. And linen, I have quite a number of linen clothes. This is a black linen dress. Linen <coughs> is the strongest fabric. Strongest fabric. It can take the hottest heat. 
On your iron, you can see that the hottest heat is for linen. It wrinkles, though, very easily. So you just move in linen and it wrinkles. So it's a constant reminder, not only to those who were on the Sinai Desert floor and had to look at that white linen every day, that fence around the sanctuary. It's our protection. Christ's righteousness, his purity is being illustrated for us in the fence, and then there was a number of other things that were linen. That was the priest's garment. So learning how the priest dressed in principle, not that we are to wear white linen today. And there are some people that interpret it that that's what we should do. That's a misinterpretation because God wants us to learn by principle. So linen is strong. Linen um, takes hot heat. That means heat is like trials. You can, with the righteousness of Christ, being clothed in that, you can take hot trials. You can take hot temperatures. You can take people not uh, wanting to hear what you have to say. You can take these things. So that white linen is a representation of the, the um, bride's gown. Who the, we're the bride, the church. And we're preparing to meet the groom, Christ. And so white linen has so many principles that as we learn about it, um, we can be reminded of what God is trying to do for us. So it's more than just how we dress, but it's what it represents and how people will uh, see in us that we want to follow Jesus, a peculiar people. And it says it's not their dress that makes them peculiar, but because they are a peculiar and holy people, they cannot carry the marks of likeness to the world. Come out of her, my people, the three angels' messages. Babylon has fallen. Come out of her. Don't receive her mark in the hand or the forehead. Marks. So every time I see that word mark, I think of, am I receiving the mark or seal of God in my forehead or of the enemy? The present plan of education, with the present plan of education, what is it saying here? A door is open. A door is open to what? Temptation is open to the youth. Although they generally have too many hours of study, they have many hours without anything to do. These leisure hours are frequently spent in a reckless manner. The knowledge of bad habits is communicated from one to another and vice is greatly increased. Here we have the little baby elephants once again playing. They're close to mother, the matriarch as well. Um, elephants, they stay in the family group and they're all helping one another. And when you send your children, uh, even the youth who you may have, we're going to see here, uh, been trying to educate rightly, to send them away, many times they come back um, with vices that they have picked up from others. Very many young men who have been religiously instructed at home and who go out to the schools comparatively innocent and virtuous become corrupt by associating with vicious companions. They lose self-respect and sacrifice noble principles. Then they're prepared to pursue the downward path for they have so abused their consciences. The conscience is that judge in the mind that says, is it right? And now they're with their friends and they choose to be like their vicious friends. For they have so abused their consciences that sin does not appear so exceedingly sinful. These evils which exist in the schools that are conducted according to the present plan might be remedied in a great degree if study and labor were combined. The same evils exist in the higher schools only in a greater degree. For many of the youth have educated themselves in vice and their consciences are seared. What is this animal? Do you have these here? An armadillo, that's right. This is a mother armadillo with her babies. We have these in Alabama. They come out usually at night. 
they can't see very well uh, and they scrounge around uh, looking for insects and so forth and they have this coat of armor on and um, they'll roll up into a ball if they uh, are fearful and um, we are to have on an armor aren't we a spiritual armor to protect us and our children and I thought that I would <coughs> excuse me <laughs> share that the armadillo God is trying to illustrate for us our need through these different illustrations Many parents overrate the stability and good qualities of their children. They do not seem to consider that they will be exposed to the deceptive influences of vicious youth. Parents have their fears as they send them some distance away to school, but flatter themselves that as they have had good examples and religious instruction, they will be true to principle in their high school life. Many parents have but a faint idea to what extent licentiousness exists in these institutions of learning. In many cases, the parents have labored hard and suffered many privations for the cherished object of having their children obtain a finished education. And after all their efforts, many have the bitter experience of receiving their children from their course of studies with desolate habits and ruined constitutions. <laughs> Frequently, they are disrespectful to their parents, unthankful and unholy. These abused parents who are thus rewarded by ungrateful children lament that they sent their children from them to be exposed to temptations and come back to them physical, mental, and moral wrecks. With disappointed hopes and almost broken hearts, they see their children of whom they had high hopes follow in a course of vice and drag out a miserable existence. But there are those of firm principles who answer the expectations of parents and teachers. They go through the course of schooling with clear consciences and come forth with good constitutions and morals unstained by corrupting influences. But we're told this number is few. So parents need to really know their children. Not all can handle going off to institutions, schools. I know I went off to um, academy. It was a boarding academy for my high school years. Um, it was better for me than my home. My father wasn't a Christian. It was better for me than going to public school. I was very thankful to be attending a quote-unquote Christian school. Uh, <clears throat> for uh, my children, God led me to understand better true education principles. So I chose as their parent, one parent, to educate at home. Uh, I felt that God was calling me to do that. Yet, in my home, my husband was not in total agreement. He agreed at first, um, but <clears throat> as I reformed in health, as I reformed in dress, uh, and now in education, uh, my husband did not read and study to understand why these changes were taking place in our home and so when in the home there isn't an understanding then you have trouble you have problems and so we had several TVs in our home and on Sabbath before the Sabbath was even over that TV was being turned on uh, movies were being shown and um, that's not what uh, God was leading uh, me to have for my children, so there became some division there. My husband uh, <clears throat> made copies of this 10 principles of true education, uh, and I studied it. I studied that, and I knew what um, I was then being committed to to homeschool my child or children. My husband made a copy for himself, but he did not read it. 
these books, the Bible, the spirit of prophecy, they do not do us any good by sitting on our shelf. And even though we might hear sermons or talks where these tools are being used, it is second hand. You will not have a conviction because uh, maybe some great speaker told you this. The conviction, and we're going to go over that Sunday morning, what is the difference between a preference and a conviction? A preference is something that you'll change. A conviction you won't change, no matter if you're threatened that someone's going to take your children, no matter if you're going to be put to death, you will not change. So are your beliefs convictions or are they preferences? In, in the area of education, you may not have known that it is a religious duty. A religious du if it's a religious duty, if God is calling you to do it, and you don't search into the hows and how do you do it and the whys and so forth, then it'll be a preference and your children will get what is just out there and available. So these are all things that you individually, husband, wife, must study for yourself so that you'll know uh, why you're doing it and nothing will be able to uh, change um, your beliefs. Um, I did go into the court setting and um, I did get a divorce and uh, my husband wanted my children to be put in school and um, I had a Jewish attorney and uh, the Jewish attorney told me, she said, uh, just be honest be honest and so I was able to show what I had been doing for home education that it was a spiritual um, a religious conviction of mine that this is what God was calling me to do to educate my children uh, with and um, the judge asked to speak to the two attorneys on the phone and um, my uh, Jewish attorney with the information that I gave her was able to, by God's help, give the judge what was needful, so he stated that he did not need to hear the issue in court. In the United States, we have something called the Constitution, and under that Constitution, we have amendments, and we have freedom of religion still, though it is it is being, um, is waning, you might say. It's being taken away because parents don't understand in this area of education that it is a religious duty. And so um, on the Sunlight Downloads, you will have five talks by a Christian attorney. And these talks tell about what is your duty, your religious duty to your children to educate them the way that God tells you to educate them and that the state really has nothing to say about it. But if the parents don't understand that, then uh, they will do what the state tells them to do. And in these five talks, it says that the reason that today uh, the state has so much power over even Christian education is because the state came to the church and said you have to accredit that's where you get the degree from. <clears throat> you have to accredit your schools, accredit and license them. The church did not ask about that. Why do you have to do that? And so the church said, okay, we will do that. And by uh, licensing and accrediting the church schools, they are saying that the church school is not a part of the church. It is a part of, it's like a business. It's a part of something that a lower, which is um, the state is saying that it's reigning and now to accredit something that's saying you're a lower because then it has control over you. And in the United States, the churches are not um, licensed. The buildings are licensed so that you are showing that you have a safe building. But what you teach in that uh, church the state cannot tell you what to teach and preach, but when your schools are licensed and accredited, then what is taught in the schools is dictated by the state in order to get that degree. And so now we have 
we have errors coming into the pulpit because of the way that they have been educated, those teachers and preachers. Just like when Jesus was here, the same thing had happened to their education system, and this is why Jesus could not go, and John the Baptist could not go to their schools. I just am trying to help you to see uh, what God has shown me through my study to protect my children and to help my children be able to have true education so that in the end, um, as we near the time of trouble and the uh, Sunday law comes and there's a decree saying we can't worship, that we, God will have been teaching us daily, every day, how to stand up courageously for our beliefs. But at the same time, we must be educating ourselves and our children as to what our beliefs are. And if we think that even our schools are doing that, um, they may have a Bible class, that is not enough. Bible must be interwoven into every class, mathematics, um, history, uh, geography, prophecy, language, music. It should be, what does God say? And you'll see that in Jesus' education, when he was asked a question, would he say, would he not say, it is written? It is written. Can we do that today? I'm thankful for this technology because I wasn't trained that way. I don't have those it is written um, in my mind. I can go to them fast, though, with the technology that we have. So, but this is a way that God is educating and training me who uh, was not educated God's way. But we can be doing this daily so that when we are brought before judges and kings, the Holy Spirit can bring back the truth that we have planted, those seeds of truth that have been planted in our hearts. So God wants to educate us truly what is our religious duty so that the beliefs that we have become convictions. We will not change them and our children will know what our beliefs are and prayerfully they too, like Daniel who shows us that he was convicted that the way he was trained, um, that it would possibly cost him his life if he said that he would not eat of the king's meat. But God impressed uh, that eunuch to um, to get the approval that he, Daniel, could eat the way that God um, wanted him to eat. All right, here's some hummingbirds. Uh, once again, God is trying to bring us back to our need as families to be educating our children his way. But there are those of firm principles who answer the expectations of parents and teachers. They go through the course of schooling with clear consciences and come forth with good constitutions and morals, unstained by corrupting influences, but the number is few. Some students put their whole being into their studies and concentrate their mind upon the object of obtaining an education. They work the brain but allow the physical powers to remain inactive. The brain is overworked and the muscles become weak because they are not exercised. I can tell you my muscles are quite weak because the physical exercise, especially when you are working full time, it's difficult to get that um, physical work in. So whether we're working or whether we're in school, we need to be working the muscles and not just the brains. When these students graduate, it is evident that they have obtained their education at the expense of life. They have studied day and night, year after year, keeping their minds continually upon the stretch while they have failed to sufficiently exercise their muscles. They sacrificed all for a knowledge of the sciences and pass to their graves. This is my father. He died about a little over a year ago. Um, <clears throat> he was in his 80s. And uh, prayerfully, um, he, he saw in those last moments of his life, um, he saw Christ in some that came and cared for him. Uh, my mother was a Christian. Uh, she took us to church every week. But, you know, we who call ourselves Christians sometimes, many times, are, have blind spots and can't see our defects. And how by our characters, how our lives 
we're keeping maybe some in our own families away from knowing Christ. We have no idea. We see differently than God sees. And um, prayerfully, uh, we need to be asking God to change us, to make us more like Him, to help to save those in our own families first, and then those around us. Young ladies frequently give themselves up to study to the neglect of other branches of education, even more essential for practical life than the study of books. And after having obtained their education, they are often invalids for life. They neglected their health by remaining too much indoors, deprived of the pure air of heaven and of the God-given sunlight. These young ladies might have come from their schools in health had they combined their studies household labor and exercise in the open air. So study and physical exercise, being outdoors as much as possible. Here's a butterfly. Uh, we love to, to see butterflies. They remind me with their beautiful wings of how we're going to be transformed when Jesus comes back. We're going to fly off from this planet. I wonder what our wings will look like. God is a lover of the beautiful. Yet we're told about butterflies that we're not to be like them in a certain area. Butterflies look beautiful, don't they? And they flit here and flit there from flower to flower, getting that sweet nectar. And sometimes, you know, they even will go get water in muddy locations and so forth. But we're told that they don't really have a purpose. They don't have direction. They're just looking beautiful. And so let that not be said of us, and especially our, our women, uh, that they, oh, they're so beautiful, they look so beautiful, but they don't have purpose. And that's what I believe God is trying to tell us, that especially our women, our women need to be uh, they need to understand about the home and how to keep the home organized. And uh, then, you know, they can, of course, get other, have other studies and other majors and so forth. But if they don't have that early training, that domestic training, uh, they will really miss out and not be able to manage a home. We're told that if you can cook healthfully, you have 10 talents. 10 talents. If you don't have those 10 talents yet, develop them and that's something that you can do in your high school years if you haven't developed it thus far. That is one of the uh, classes, good health. They neglected their health by remaining too much indoors, deprived of the pure air of heaven. These young ladies might have come from their schools in health had they combined with their studies household labor and exercise in the open air. And there's a beautiful bird. <clears throat> health is a great treasure it is the richest possession mortals can have health a treasure and so this definitely is needs to be a study <clears throat> and once again a butterfly wealth honor or learning is dearly purchased if it be at the loss of the vigor of health None of these attainments can secure happiness if health is wanting. It is a terrible sin to abuse the health that God has given us. For every abuse of health enfeebles us for life and makes us losers, even if we gain any amount of education. In many cases, parents who are wealthy do not feel the importance of giving their children an education in the practical duties of life, as well as in the sciences. They do not see the necessity for the good of their children's minds and morals, and for their future usefulness of giving them a thorough understanding of useful labor. This is due their children that, should misfortune come, they could stand forth in noble independence knowing how to use their hands. If they have a capital of strength, they cannot be poor even if they have not a dollar. And there are many people, uh, students that come to Uchi Pines and they're placed in different areas to work. Sometimes they're placed in housekeeping for six months. Sometimes they're placed in the kitchen 
or uh, in landscaping and agriculture. And if they have the wrong uh, thoughts about that type of work, some don't make it through that study. Instead of learning what they can there and, um, and using it for the good. Many who in youth were in affluent circumstances may be robbed of all their riches and be left with parents and brothers and sister de sisters dependent upon them for sustenance. Then how important that every youth be educated to labor, that they may be prepared for any emergency. Riches are indeed a curse when their possessors let them stand in the way of their sons and daughters obtaining a knowledge of useful labor, that they may be qualified for practical life. The question that our youth must be asking, and even before that, John the Baptist's father, Zechariah, kept ever before that child as he was growing up what his mission would be. So John the Baptist knew what his mission was. And it was his choice to not live in the city, to go to the wilderness so that he could learn more about what his mission was in order to accomplish it. Not only is the growth of Christ's kingdom illustrated by the parable of the mustard seed, but in every stage of its growth, the experience represented in the parable is repeated. For his church in every generation, God has a special truth and a special work. The truth that is hid from the worldly wise and prudent is revealed to the childlike and humble. It calls for self-sacrifice. I see a red shirt there. That's a reminder. It's a call for self-sacrifice. It has battles to fight and victories to win. At the outset, its advocates are few. If you're looking for this message of true education to be popular, it is not. Few will accept it. By the great men of the world and by a world-conforming church, they are opposed and despised. And here we have a list of um, a number of those that were a part of that few. See John the Baptist, the forerunner of Christ, standing alone to rebuke the pride and formalism of the Jewish nation. See the first bearers of the gospel into Europe. How obscure, how hopeless seemed the mission of Paul and Silas, the two tent makers, as they with their companions took ship at Troas for Philippi. See Paul the aged in chains, preaching Christ in the stronghold of the Caesars. See the little communities of slaves and peasants in conflict with the heathenism of imperial Rome. See Martin Luther withstanding that mighty church, which is the masterpiece of the world's wisdom. See him holding fast God's word against emperor and pope, declaring, here I take my stand, I cannot do otherwise. God be my help. See John Wesley preaching Christ and his righteousness in the midst of formalism, sensualism, and infidelity. See one burdened with the woes of the heathen world, pleading for the privilege of carrying to them Christ's message of love. Hear the response of ecclesiasticism. Sit down, young man. When God wants to convert the heathen, he will do it without your help or mine. The great leaders of religious thought in this generation sound the praises and build the monuments of those who planted the seed of truth centuries ago. Do not many turn from this work to trample down the growth springing from the same seed today? The old cry is repeated, we know that God spake unto Moses as for this fellow, Christ is the messenger he sends. We know not from whence he is, John 9, 29. As in earlier ages, the special truths for this time are found, not with the ecclesiastical authorities, but with men and women who are not too learned or too wise to believe the word of God. The call. For we see, ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And base things of the world and things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not, to bring to naught things that are. 1 Corinthians 1, 26-28 That your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men 
but in the power of God. 1 Corinthians 2, 5. And in this last generation, the parable of the mustard seed is to reach a signal and triumphant fulfillment. The little seed will become a tree. The last message of warning and mercy is to go to every nation and kindred and tongue. Revelation 14, 6 through 14. To take out of them a people for his name. And the earth shall be lightened with his glory. Here's a little peach tree that we planted from a peach seed. The mustard seed is the smallest seed. And that's the size of faith that God has given to everyone. And how you develop that seed that he has placed there is how much faith you'll have in the end. Will I find faith when I return, Jesus says. I pray that your education, day by day, helps to increase and to grow your faith. Shall we have a word of prayer to close? Dear Father in heaven, <clears throat> thank you for being here with us. Thank you for keeping our minds stayed on you. Thank you for showing us truths from your word. Father, I pray that you were heard today. You are the great speaker. May we follow you is our prayer and keep our eyes fixed on you, your divine plan for education, on what you want for us, though we may be few who find the truth and follow in your steps. We know that you want the whole world to follow after you. So if our lives can influence anyone, may you get all the glory. We thank you for this time together and for what you have taught us. In the name of Jesus, amen.